Mountain biking has developed incredibly fast. If you consider that the first mountain bikes only really went on sale just over 40 years ago, it's staggering to look at the innovation that we can see on bikes. So for today's video, we are gonna be comparing a 2022 modern day trail bike against a 1991 counterpart, one of the earliest full suspension bikes on the market. To make this video, Shimano kindly lent us this vintage Cannondale from 1991. Uh, the bike actually normally sits in their experience center in the Netherlands where it's proudly on display. So I promise to take care of it. Uh, certainly not gonna be riding this one. Now this bike, as I said, came out in 1991 and was Cannondale's first full suspension bike. It was one of three models. This one is the mid spec version and it makes a great comparison compared to a modern day trail bike. Now let's have a look, shall we? And we'll see just how far we've come in the 31 years between these two bikes. So this is the Cannondale SE 2000. They made a 1000 and a 3000. Uh, this is the one we're lucky enough to have here. So this uses the EST rear suspension system. So this was Cannondale's first rear suspension system. And as you can see, it has a swing arm style design with a single pivot, which is very high in its placement, and you've got a coil shock to activate it. It's made from aluminium, which was what really made Cannondale famous on a mountain bike scene. Cannondale chose what they call a lugless design or just a welded design, essentially. So the frames are TIG welded and the welding is absolutely pristine. It's beautiful. Look how smooth the welds are. It's almost got the same sort of flow as a modern carbon frame. Okay, and over here to the modern day trail bike. So this is an altogether different concept. So this is an Orbea Occam LT, that stands for long travel. It's a carbon fiber front end using Orbea's OMR carbon system. And it creates a very stiff and lightweight chassis to hang the rear suspension design off. And that itself couldn't be more different from that Cannondale SE2000. Now compared to modern day mountain bikes, I have a one by transmission on them and lots of room down by the bottom bracket. There was loads of stuff going on on 26 inch wheel bikes back in the day. You wanted to have a short enough rear end so your handling remained responsive, but trying to fit a short rear end with mud clearance and a pivot and three chain rings with a good chain line down there was nearly impossible. Many brands struggled to get this right. But Cannondale did a smart move here by moving the pivot out of the way. You got all the space down here for the chain rings and your mud clearance, no problem at all. Now, like the Cannondale, this also has a single pivot design, but it has a linkage here to drive the shock. And you also might notice when you look at the rear wheel axle, it has a concentric pivot around that rear wheel axle. And what it creates is a bike that's very active the whole time. It's active when you're pedaling, it's active when you're freewheeling, it's active when you're braking. The point is, if the wheel can stay tracking the ground, you get traction the whole time. The shock on it is a coil shock. There was three different springs, soft, medium and hard, I guess. I don't know what they were in terms of their pound rating on them. And it's a basic oil damper. So the only adjustment you could make was changing the springs and adjusting the spring preload. No damping, no compression, no rebound, but it delivered around 40 mil travel, but still offered a surprisingly good ride. And this one actually still works quite well. The shock absorber on this bike, just like the Cannondale, is a coil shock. Now, along the way, after the first coil shock that Cannondale used, they started using air shocks. Now, air shocks are very good on bicycles. Uh, the original ones weren't so good, uh, but modern day air shocks have a big negative spring, have a big positive spring, and they're generally excellent. We are seeing a bit of a resurgence in the coil shock, especially when it comes to heavier duty travel trail bikes and the same with enduro bikes. It has a piggyback reservoir on here and it has three points of, well, four points of adjustment. You can adjust the preload on the spring and there's multiple spring options so you can fine tune the weight, the spring weight that is to your body. And then you've got low speed rebound adjustment, low speed compression adjustment, and then you've got a lockout lever. Now you might notice there's no suspension fork on the front like there is with the modern bike. Uh, this is a rigid fork. This was Cannondale's own fork called the Pepperoni. I always used to love this shape 
as a kid. Not really sure why, it's just a bendy fork. Uh, apparently the design did enable it to reduce some trail buzz, but let's face it, it was still a rigid fork. The suspension at the front end though was taken by the flex stem. Now this stem has a main pivot and you have like a dog bone on the underneath here and you have an elastomer rubber. That's essentially your spring and your damper in one. There are four different springs. There was yellow, red, green, and blue, and that's in order of the durometer. So the yellow is the softest and the blue is the firmest. Now, depending on the length of the stem, there's about three quarters of an inch of travel available to you. And because of the fact your fork wasn't diving, it was a really efficient system to use because you could ham hammer the bike basically and the combination of the back end of the bike standing up and not doing anything and no bob at the front end really did make the bike feel like it's a rigid bike but you had element of taking the sting out at the front end. And onto the fork, and again, I mean, well, this literally couldn't be more different to that little skinny pepperoni fork on the Cannondale over there. So this is a telescopic hydraulic suspension fork. You have an air spring in here. The air spring itself is adjustable. You can adjust the air volume, so you can adjust the feeling from a more, more linear action to a more progressive action, depending on the way that you want to ride. And it has a four-way adjustable damping system in there. So you've got both low and high-speed compression adjustable externally here from a dial, and the same with rebound at the bottom of the fork there. On this 1991 Special, you've got a three by seven system. So you've got 21 gears available to you. Now at the front here, you've got a DRXT M730 crank set. So this one's a 175 crank, but you might've had a 170 depending on the frame size. And of course, those three chain rings, the sizing of these, uh, 26, 36, 46. 46, what a massive gear on there. I mean, it seems crazy to have a gear that big. And of course, the tiny little 26 there, we used to call them the granny gear because you could like winch your way up any old climb. So you've got a Shimano DRXT M8100 transmission on here, 175 millimeter cranks with a 32 tooth single chainring at the front. And then the chainring itself has technology built into this. So it's a single chainring. And if you look at the profile of the teeth, you'll see that they're alternating between narrow and wide in profile. And that's to correlate to the narrow and wide sections of the inner of the chain links. So you think if the chain can sit correctly onto the chain ring, there's no way it's gonna wobble around basically and jump off. So it really does help keep the chain in place. And it's part of Shimano's Dynamic Chain Engagement Plus system. Then you've got the Uniglide chain on here. This was before uh, chains got really narrow and started having better features on them, but the chain worked incredibly well with what was at the time, the brand new seven speed Hyperglide cassette. So if you look at the chain on here, so an M8100 chain, you'll see when you look super close up, the inner chain links actually sit lower than the outer links. And the idea of this is to increase the contact and also to lower friction. If it's low in friction, it's gonna be low in noise, it's gonna work better and there's less chance of the chain derailing. So the cassette itself had uh, 13 to 30 teeth on here, so 13 at the small end and up to a 30. Now the cassette itself was an incredible bit of design because of the fact that Shimano designers identified the fact that mountain biking, the way that you change gears was very different to touring and very different to road riding and road racing in the fact that you'd often be changing gear under immense load and torque. And as a result, you could chew up the gears or just get gear shifts that weren't very clean. So they developed Hyperglide, which as you look at the cassette teeth here, you can see some of the teeth are slightly different in profile to the others. They're almost more like hooks when you look at them directly from above, as I am here. And when you look on the side, you can see there's like kind of shifting gates, I guess you could call them, on the sides of the actual cassette sprockets there. And they're designed to hook the chain up faster and under load, which really did make a significant difference to shifting. And that's something that we really have benefited from uh, ever since. And then onto the cassette itself, which is a bit of a masterpiece to be fair. So you've got these 12 sprockets here, two of which at the top are made from aluminium just to save a bit of weight, and the rest are made from steel to keep them working and keep them durable. Now the cassette design itself, they had to completely redesign the cassette in order to get that 10 tooth to work. So they had to redesign the free hub body system. So the excellent free hub body we've already seen on the seven speed system with the Hyperglide has been improved. So you've now got a Hyperglide Plus. So those shifting ramps and pins and profile teeth, they actually now pull the chain back down into higher gears as well as allowing you to shift up. It doesn't matter how hard you're pedaling, that chain comes flying down the block. It's astonishing how well this system works. 
But as explained, to get that 10 tooth to work, they had to rework their existing hub system. So instead of the old spline system, as you can see, we've now got the micro spline system. So these splines offer a body that is actually slightly shorter and a 10 speed tooth actually hangs over the edge and the splines offer a better interface. M735 front derailleur there from the RXT and the rear another M735 here. This one's with the long cage. They had two options, a long and a short cage. Uh, the shorter cage one did look much better but you couldn't use it with such a wide range of gears because it didn't have the capacity to take up the chain slack essentially. Now the layout of the rear derailleur is fairly similar from where you're looking. Uh, from where I'm looking it sticks out loads more compared to the modern ones because on the modern rear derailleurs you have like shadow technology that really tucks it under that cassette this looks quite exposed. So it's nice to see that this one's actually in really good condition because more often than not, they'd get bent just from tagging them on rocks and things all the time. Adjustment points are the same. You still have the B screw or the B tension and the upper and higher limit screws there. But interestingly, on the older style rear derailleurs here, they used to have a barrel adjuster on the actual derailleur as well as the one up at the bar set on the shifters. Uh, you'd always use this one when setting the gears up on the bike in the work stand and you'd use the other ones when you're on the trail. Uh, of course, on modern day bikes, you only have them at the shifter end. So you've got shadow plus. So the shadow part of the rear derailleur means the derailleur is tucked underneath. So even though there's far more going on at the back of the bike here, the derailleur is far more tucked away than it is compared to looking at the one that was on the Cannondale. And you've also got the clutch on here. You've got a clutch lever, you can turn it on, you can turn it off, and you can adjust the tension that it provides. So the upper part of the chain is often under tension when you're pedaling. The lower part of the chain is never under tension. It's always moving around. So this is why the spring on the derailleur takes up that tension. By adding the clutch on there, it adds further tension on the bottom part of the chain. And what tends to happen when you lose your chain is the chain will unravel from the bottom. So it dramatically reduces the chances of your chain coming off. It's day and night compared to what it used to be. Your chain used to come off all the time on old transmissions. Now, looking at the shifters on here, this is something interesting. So you've got M734 XT, M735 XT, M730 XT, and you've got M732 XT shifters. Yeah, you've got the XT thumb shifters up at the front here. And that really pleases me because at the time when uh, this group set was specced in 1991 on this particular bike, Cannondale could have chosen to put the SCI under the bar shifters on this particular bike. Now that would have meant having the joined on brake levers, which was very cool and it did work extremely well. But a lot of people decided either A, they didn't want to have the same brake lever and shifter it built into one unit, or B, they just didn't like the way that those double push button shifters worked. The thumb shifters were an incredible piece of kit. They worked so well but they're not that intuitive on top of the bars. However, they have got one really cool thing up their sleeve. Being seven speed thumb shifters, they actually had a hidden eighth click on them. Now, I don't know if Shimano deliberately did this, but it just happened to work perfectly well with the eight speed system that they later released in 1994, which meant if you were a fan of the thumb shifters and you didn't like the way things are going with the underbar shifter system, you could just buy a set of seven speed XT thumb shifters and continue to use them with eight speed. That was super cool back in the day. And then you have the shifters, which actually have been one of my favorite things since they've been released. So they're using a the trigger shifter system. So unlike the earlier STI double button shifters where you change up and change down by pushing buttons, you only change into a lower gear, so shifting up, up the block into a lower gear using your thumb, and you've got the trigger which you can actually push with your thumb or you can pull with your finger, uh, whichever way you want to go, to shift down again. It's super natural, it's just there, sat in the palm of your hand, ready for use anytime. You've also got multi-shift, so you can go all the way up through the block in just a couple of shifts with the big thumb paddle there, and then you can do multi-shift on the way back down again. Bang, 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 every time, perfect gear changes. Now the last thing I'd like to just reference between the two different transmissions are what you're getting in terms of gear range uh, and in the highest and lowest of gears as well. Because you might think by having three by seven, you're gonna have lower gears available to you and higher gears, but it's not necessarily true. Uh, of course, it does depend on the size of the chain rings and the cassette, but this particular one with the 46 and the 13 in the rear and the 26 and the 30, your highest gear, you're gonna get a 91.8 inch gear and the lowest gear, a 22.5. Uh, so that's effectively how far you'll travel for a revolution there. The new 1x12 wins in both counts. So with a 32 tooth chain ring that's on the front of the bike, you're getting a 92.6 inch gear, so you're getting a higher, 
higher gear, and you're getting a lower lower gear at 18.2 inches. Quite crazy. So 510% gear range on the modern system versus 408% on the old system. Uh, quite crazy. Way less gears, way less going on, far more simplified, and yet you've got a bigger gear, you've got a lower gear, and you've got more range. It's amazing. Now you probably noticed that the bar and stem combo as well, regardless of the fact it's a suspension stem, very different to the modern day bikes. So the bar itself is a Ritchie Force Lite, it's a completely flat bar, 600 millimeters wide. A far cry from the modern day cockpits, you have uh, anything in the region from 750 up to 800 mil, depending on rider preference. And the stem, of course, uh, the stem between 40 and 50 millimeters is far more common, whereas the older stems, like this one, 135 millimeters. And this wasn't even particularly long. Some riders had stems up to 150 millimeters long. But that said, the overall position on the bike when you're sat down isn't too dissimilar. So the distance between the handlebars and the saddle are fairly similar, but the way they got there was different. You had a longer stem and you had a shorter frame, whereas now you have a short stem and you have a longer frame. The effect of that is you've got the front wheel further out front, much more confidence inspiring and much better off-road. So the top tube on this Cannondale was 615 millimeters long versus the top tube on the Orbea is 649 millimeters long. Now, when you look at the other geometry, it all brings things into relativity here. So the seat angle on this is 73 degrees and the head angle is 71 degrees. Whereas you look across to the Orbea, the modern day bike, you've got a 76 and a half degree seat angle, so much steeper, and you've got a 65 and a half degree head angle, so much slacker, so they're almost the other way round. Uh, yet they still offer a nice roomy size. Out back, the chain stay on this bike, bearing in mind it has far smaller wheels, uh, is 425 millimeters long, whereas skipping over to the Orbea with the much bigger 29 inch wheels, it has a 440 millimeter chain stay on there. So it is of course proportional to the size of the bike, the size of the, uh, the wheels on there, but very different in terms of the overall fit. Now many people grumble about modern day disc brakes and having to bleed the brakes and change the brake pads, but the reality is, Modern day disc brakes are an absolute cinch to set up and are certainly far easier than these old cantilevers because there are so many things going on here. Just looking at the cantilevers shows you how much adjustment was needed. You could spend hours trying to get your brakes feeling good in the workshop before riding. It was a nightmare. I mean, admittedly, you could get them feeling good and they'd be great once set up, but man, it just took forever. So you've got the rubber brake shoes, as you can see here, and they're on long posts. So you could adjust the distance of the brake pad on that post from the actual cantilever itself. Uh, the further away it was, the more leverage you would get with the cantilever, of course, but the downside is you would have a slightly more mushy feel because you're using that leverage. So there's a fine tuning between uh, too much and too little there. Then you could adjust the angle of the brake as well. So much adjustment for so little braking power. So we've got four piston hydraulic brakes running mineral fluid. You've got adjustable lever position. You've got a servo wave action in the lever. So the harder you pull the brakes, the more you get out of them. So you've got proper modulation. And then of course, we've got the rotors themselves. So you get a variety of different size rotors. So these rotors are actually have a bit of a sandwich design. So you've got a steel braking track, but on the inside of that is alloy to help pull the heat away. And you've got an alloy spider to hold it together. Add this with the braking fins that you have on the two-part brake pads. So you've got a steel braking pad, but it has an alloy heat fin system basically to further pull the heat away. Now, as you probably noticed, the biggest fundamental difference between them is the fact that the Cannondale is rolling on 26 inch wheels, whereas the modern Orbea on 29. So yes, I could have picked a bike with 27 and a half, but I wanted to illustrate the biggest difference between the two. And going back to 26 really does show this off. Now these wheels are running on Shimano DRXT hubs, they're M732 hubs. So at the front is a quick release hub, 100 millimeter, fairly standard. At the rear end is 135 millimeter, again, with quick release and it's got a seven speed cassette on the back. Now the cool thing about the Shimano system is they're using Hyperglide on here and they're using a proper splined free hub body. Unlike other earlier systems of a similar time where they used a screw on style block. Now the problem with the screw on style blocks is that the axles weren't supported properly. You'd actually have the bearings that are in the hub and there wouldn't really be anything going on in the block itself. So you had a portion of the axle that wasn't supported and as a result, it wasn't uncommon to snap rear wheel axles. 
When Shimano developed the proper freewheel system like you have in here, you had bearings equally spaced supporting that rear wheel axle. So really actually a very good system and it's one that we still use today. Admittedly, the modern day standards are much bigger. Now let's have a look at the wheels. Now just everything about them just looks bigger and burlier. So even the rims on modern day bikes are high tech. You can get carbon rims, and like on this bike here, you can have alloy rims. And now we have bolt through hubs. So you've got a QR15 system available up on the front here. So a 15 millimeter axle with 110 millimeter spacing. So just much bigger, better bracing angle there. Um, makes for a stronger wheel as well because the spokes can be further apart. So that bracing angle of the spokes when the wheel is built, even that adds to the strength and durability of the front end. The rear, even bigger. 148 millimeters, but that has to accommodate a lot more. You're putting a disc brake on there now, and you're also putting much bigger cassettes. And also, to have those big cassettes and have all the stability, the back end of the bike needs to be wider to cope with this. Uh, but again, everything has evolved, and every single thing on here is offering something that the older bikes from 1991 just couldn't offer. Uh, they probably couldn't even imagine that this sort of technology was gonna happen in the future. Modern mountain bikes have never been so good and I absolutely love where we are today with mountain bikes. And I'd love to know actually what you love about your modern mountain bike. And actually, if you have ridden an old mountain bike like something like that in the past, what did you love and hate about it? Let us know in those comments underneath and we'll see you in another video soon. Take care.